Yes. So today, we are going to continue with chapter six. We're still doing Piaget. And we finished with, thank God, sensory motor period, right? And I did go into detail with sensory motor period because how he conceptualizes development, how he places central importance to action is very much evident in how he thinks about infant development. And so I think having a good foundation in sensory motor development will help you better appreciate the later stages. It's going to let you better appreciate the pre-operational stage, the concrete operational stage, and the formal operational stage. That's why we spent so much time there. And so the pre-operational stage is approximately from two to seven years of age, but we did say that ages were not very important. Um, and what happens at the stage? What can the child do? The child is capable of mental representation. We talked quite a bit about this at the end of sensory motor period, so I won't elaborate on it. The child now has some functional language. Don't get me wrong, it's not that children aren't <laughs> talking until two years of age, they are. But language becomes a little bit more precise, their vocabulary is larger, and we can confidently say that they are symbolically representing objects, events, actions through words and sentences. Uh, and um, make-believe play uh, is evident, pretend play. Again, pretend play starts mostly around 18 months of age. <coughs> now children can actually more flexibly engage in it. We're going to spend some time on it. And children are capable of dual representation, so they are able to extract information from a symbolic source and use it. We will talk about this too. And so why is it called pre-operational? Operational thought requires that children mentally combine, separate, or transform information in a logical manner. And if children aren't able to do that and they're making systematic errors, that is called the pre-operational stage for Piaget. So what are these systematic errors? Two of the most important ones at this stage are um, their problems with centration, uh, and also their problems then with reversibility. I changed the slide. It's very interesting that I don't see the change here. So centration is focusing on, uh, it's going to come back. Centration is focusing on one feature or aspect of an event or object to the exclusion of others. So it's being very detail oriented in a way that the child focuses on the detail and kind of forgets the large picture. I'm going to give examples. This is going to become clearer. The opposite of centration, decentration, actually gives the child the ability to think objectively, not being swayed by little details. Okay. Reversibility is, just like the name implies, is having a, mm, a plan of action to solve a problem, let's say, and solving that problem. But reversibility is being able to backtrack your steps in your mind being able to reverse what you have done to think about both those steps and the starting state. So that's reversibility. And now, why am I talking about centration and reversibility? I'm trying to say that children make two big systematic errors in the pre-operational stage. And one of them is their inability to um, decenter meaning as they make a centration error. And their thinking is characterized by irreversibility. They can't reverse. We will talk as, about this and see it more clearly in a conservation task, OK? OK. And here I got that result of centration and reversibility. There is a lack of hierarchical classification, which again is the result of centration. I'm going to give an example of this, hold on to the idea. And there is precausal reasoning, uh, which is characterized by both transductive reasoning, animistic thinking, and artificialism. There's egocentrism, and there's problems with appearance reality distinction. All of these points, I will give examples now, so no worries. Okay, 
So piezinity in conservation tasks, many of you already know this, right? Is there anybody who's never heard of a conservation task before? All right. So as you know, we give children some stimuli and we alter it in some way. After the alteration, we need the child to compare the end result with the beginning state. Usually we give them two stimuli. And so if the original presentation are two lines of coins, as you can see, and here we are looking at number or length, uh, the transformation is basically separating them out so that one line looks longer than the other or making them smaller, decreasing the space between the coins so that this line looks um, shorter. And what do we ask children? We ask them which of these lines has more coins. And young children are usually deceived by this perceptual feature that shows one longer and the other shorter. Although they know, so what are they centering on? They're centering on the perceptual quality of length. Okay? So they can't take their thinking away from this perceptual feature. Right? And though they also cannot reverse the operation in the sense that they don't understand, well, we haven't taken away any coins. We haven't added any coins. We basically just did one operation that did not affect the number of coins inside uh, this set. And hence, no change should happen, right? The same goes for mass. These are balls of clay. One of them is flattened, right? Uh, and we ask now, does each piece have the same amount of clay or does one have more? Liquid, again, two water glasses. Uh, now, does each glass have the same amount or does one have more? And as you can see, again, we expect children at this stage to think that this one has more water because it looks higher, although we did not take away any water from this set. Weight, again, does each of the two balls of clay weigh the same after squashed versus um, uh, the original shape, which is a sphere. And so this is why up till a certain year of age, for example, uh, Emre Bey will be able to fool Toprak until five, six. If Toprak wants two cookies, he will be able to break one into two and he will be able to fool him to think that he now has two cookies. Because it looks more. And so this is very useful, right? This is, <laughs> yes. Again, in 350, we're going to see a study about bartenders and their pouring uh, alcohol into whiskey glasses, shot glasses, other types of glasses, and their errors in conservation. Which goes to say that just because we have passed on to the penultimate stage uh, of Piaget's cognitive development doesn't mean we don't make conservation error. We also make conservation errors, but when it's a problem put in front of us to solve, when we're aware that it's a problem, we usually can reason uh, at a higher level than this. Okay. Now, if you did want to watch, and let's, no. You can watch these at uh, the comfort of your dorm room or home. Uh, this is a very nice, um, these are, and I, I have the minutes over here. This is available on YouTube. And this was a little documentary film that was made with Piaget himself. So he actually talks and uh, he explains things. And there are examples of uh, these conservation tasks. And here you can see length, seriation, volume, and if you wanted to, you can just go, these are three separate links, uh, you can go to these minutes and watch them too. Okay. Yes? Oh, it does have something to do with centration. Children center on the perceptual quality that is really salient for them. So they center on, for example, height, whereas they should be thinking about volume. They, cent they may focus on length, whereas they should be focusing on quantity. I understood like when you 
when they are doing some repeated actions, they forget the previous one and focus on the other. So it's not like that. No. It is basically taking one perceptual feature that is very salient. Salient, goza charpan, goza batan, and forgetting almost to look at the more relevant stimuli associated. You may be thinking a little bit more about reversibility. In reversibility, the child has to reason about what steps were performed in this transformation. Can I, in my mind, go back and reverse them? Okay? So, how do we get to plan an action to solve a problem is reversible? No. How you plan to solve is planning, and it's included in executive functions. Whether you can detect the solution to a problem by reversing the steps is reversibility. Thank you. And uh, yes, um, behavior that's caused by centration that characterizes pre operational child's thinking uh, include collective monologue, their communication difficulties. We will talk about these more. Focusing on a single characteristic, such as in conservation, which is exactly what, what my, my response was to say. Confusion between classes and subclasses. The example for this is coming. I will talk about it. Now, first, hierarchical classification. And here we are, confusion between classes and subclasses. Here comes the example with hierarchical classification, okay? And so when you ask pre-operational children, you show them these flowers. Are there more flowers or more red flowers in this picture? Children make errors and they answer more red flowers. What is your question? Are there more flowers in general? That's why it's hierarchical, right? There are flowers, and then underneath that big category are blue flowers and red flowers. Your question is, are there more red flowers or are there more flowers in this picture? And the pre-operational child surprises you by saying that there are more red flowers. Again, centration. Right? And so, pre-causal reasoning Children, precausal reasoning was one of the, again, errors. Let's go back and find where we said uh, we see uh, precausal reasoning. Um, yes, here. Now I'm going to explain this, okay? So here, children's thinking is characterized by transductive reasoning as opposed to inductive or deductive reasoning, meaning they make these associations between things that occur frequently together. And then they think that those two are causally linked. We do this all the time, too. We do it in research sometimes. A correlation is not a causation, right? Yes. For example, a child might claim, I did not take a nap, so it isn't afternoon because they take a nap every afternoon. It seems like one of the defining qualities of an afternoon is that the child takes a nap, right? So this kind of associative thinking uh, is transductive reasoning. There is intense interest, though, in causal relationships. And this period is characterized by all of these why questions. This is the time when parents want to go back to the time when their children were pre-verbal because they get so exhausted at answering why questions that after a while they realize that they actually don't know the information to answer some of these questions, right? That's when parents also start Googling, right? Recent research also indicates that children's causal understandings develops substantially throughout preschool. Not that it doesn't develop afterwards, but there's substantial improvement in children's causal thinking during the preschool years. What is animism and artificialism? That was also in that slide 60 or something where there was that parenthesis. So we talked about transductive reasoning. What is animism? What's artificialism? Artificialism is when people or people like agents cause natural things to happen, the thought of it, right? So why does it rain, for example? Because the angels are crying, right? Uh, thunder is the angels bowling, sky is blue because someone painted it. So there is this uh, unreal, myth almost mythological way of thinking about natural events. Now that's called artificialism. 
There's also what's called childhood animism, which is attributing intentions to an inanimate objects. Um, for example, a child might claim for the moon that the moon wants to follow the child home because as the child is driving in the car, it seems like the moon is trailing behind, right? But don't be fooled. We do this too when we get in trouble. Have you ever talked to your computer when it was misbehaving? <laughs> it wouldn't open a file. You wouldn't be able to find the file. You start talking to it, right? Where is it? What did you do with it? It sometimes happens. Usually with electronics, we have these one-way dialogues, monologues. Right? And so it's not like it disappears, uh, but our, we always know that we are actually engaging uh, in these um, non-rational ways of thinking. Why do we do this? Well, um, there's actually research and a lot of thinking in the theory of imagination, which actually is a graduate course right now that I'm teaching. Uh, let's talk after class. I don't want to take class time with this question, but I have the answer to it. Uh, if more of you are interested, come after class. Uh, and so, but the short answer would be that imagination helps us with flexible thought. Imagination is not just about uh, imagining butterflies or imagining uh, that the, the boy you really like is actually also interested in you. Imagination helps and imagination also helps with self-regulatory abilities. Okay, When you're stuck, it's actually imagining these alternatives, whether it is talking to your computer or otherwise, actually helps focus your attention maintain the task because you might get frustrated and leave it. So it makes it more playful by letting you engage in it longer. That's why we do it if we do it. So Piaget um, argues that these limitations reflect the child's failure to distinguish intentional versus physical causality. Are preschoolers limited in their understanding of causality really? Are they as limited as Piaget claimed? Uh, some not some, but I mean a whole many of researchers actually criticized Piaget because they thought that the questions that were asked children were actually very complicated and they were about things that they couldn't know or explain, such as the movements of the sun, the movements of the planet, right? How would you expect a four-year-old to explain why they see the moon all the time uh, as they are outside walking home, right? I mean, if the answer is going to be about how the moon is in orbit of the Earth and how both rotate and all of that good stuff, how the er Earth is round, then, I mean, you're not going to get that from children. And so within what they know, they try to make sense of it through explaining it uh, based on intentionality. Intentionality is something they're very good at. So they're telling you about how the moon wants to follow them home. Egocentrism. Uh, Bono asked about collective monologues. This is also coming up here too um, uh, soon. Uh, so Piaget, when we say egocentrism, please do not confuse it with the lay use of the word. Like it's not being selfish, egocentrism, right? Egocentrism is an inability to take somebody else's perspective. It's an inability to consider that not everybody else has your own perspective, that their perspective might be different. And where it starts is it starts with this visual perspective taking. And Piaget actually did start a whole line of research with the three mountains task. There's still spatial visual perspective taking tasks that are being done today with different variations, with um, brain imaging studies, with children, with people with brain trauma and the like. And where it started was this, he gave a diorama of three mountains, a three-dimensional shape, and had the child go around and look at all four sides of the table to see what the view was, right? And um, 
the child is seated on one side, either a doll or an experimenter is seated on the opposite side. Uh, and there, the child is shown various pic pictures that show various perspectives. And they're asked to identify how things would look if they were um, thinking about what the doll was looking at or seeing, or the experimenter. Children almost always choose the view that is visible to them, although they have had ample experience with the different views because they actually walked around, looked. They even point out things like here's a church, here's a little house, here's a goat, but it doesn't seem to help them in understanding the other person's perspective. Of course. Great link, yes. Yes. Because <laughs> they don't totally understand visual perspective taking. It is going to happen to um, Toprak soon enough after he's walking around and playing hide and seek. He's going to be in plain sight and he's going to think that just because he can't see, others can't see him. This also happens with binoculars, durbun. For example, you give a child binoculars and they're looking and they talk to you and they're like, do you see this? Do you see that? And they don't realize that the, they are only seeing through the binoculars and the other person doesn't have visual access to it, right? Yes. Very nice question. Mm. But object permanence is also about the property of objects. This is about what agents see. It is not the property. So, this, so remember, in object permanence, there's the object, there's the child. The child's expectation of whether the object will remain in existence even when they can't see it, that's about the, object, the property of the object. This is about what another agent is privy to visually. Good questions, thank you. And so egocentrism and communication tasks, here comes the collective monologues. Here, um, they may actually, sometimes in conversation, children seem to be talking to one another, but they're actually, everybody's talking to themselves. Mm. Uh, it happens in pet play too, uh, also. The look, children look like they're engaged in play together, uh, but uh, when you look at them closely, they're just, kind of going through the same action, sitting next to one another, even sometimes sharing objects, but not collaboratively playing. In collective monologues, too, um, the speaker isn't totally aware uh, or able to take into account the listener's perspective. The give and take isn't really there, because in conversation, I mean, you must have friends who are conversation hoggers. They talk and talk. Don't you have friends like that? Talk. I am that friend. Yes, Ipek says, I am that friend. Yaren says, I am. It's good to know thyself. Yes. Yes. Don't do it too much. You might actually exhaust the people who love you, right? Yes? No? And so um, it is basically like that. A, a good conversation, the pragmatics of co good conversation engagement requires that you give and take and that what you say is actually related to what the other person has said. That's why we sometimes use uh, very explicit breaks and say, I'm going to change the topic. I'm going to tell you something unrelated but very funny. We say those things to signal to the other person that we're going to say something and it's not following in the conversation, right? So we do this without even paying attention to it. But we are very capable of monitoring the other person's perspective. With children, it is not the case. And this experiment, uh, what they do is they basically put this screen between two children. They both have identical blocks and a peg, right? So one child who assumes the role of the speaker has to describe which block she's taking and putting on the peg to the other child who needs to mirror the actions just based on the verbal utterances of the speaker. Pre-operational children fail miserably at this task. They don't give enough information. They might say, for example, I'm taking the large block, but there might be two large blocks, which one? Right? You need to say I'm going to take the large purple block, for example. There might be two round blocks, 
they don't say I'm taking the red round block, they just say I'm taking the red block. If there are two red blocks, then there's a problem. Hence, uh, speaker gives too little information. Take this one. And listener also asks too few questions. So they aren't very good. Their inability to take different perspectives is not confined to visual perspective taking, as was evident in the three mountains task, but also in communication as well. Appearance reality. Appearance reality, well, just to make sure, Piaget never really talked about appearance reality in this way. Appearance reality research was very much influenced by Piaget in visual perspective taking and took off early 80s. Flavel uh, was one of those people, uh, one of those researchers who, was, who pioneered the field of appearance reality. He also has a comprehensive guide to Piaget. And so, appearance reality is children's inability to consider that the perceptual um, information about an object may not represent its true identity. So things may look one way, but they may in fact be something else, right? And so, uh, usually what they use is say, what does this look like? A rock, uh, but say it's a sponge, but we have painted it to look like a rock. So if I were to show you this and ask you what it was before you, I gave it to you to hold, you would have correctly said, just like you did, it's a rock. But once I give the object to you and you realize that it's um, not hard and it feels like a sponge, you're going to change your mind and you're going to see, well, this is a sponge. If I were to go back and ask, what did you first think this was when I showed it to you before I gave it to you, you are going to correctly tell me that it, you thought it was a rock. Now this very simple thing is actually very difficult for children below the age of four and a half, sometimes even five. They get confused. See, they're centering on the perceptual feature again, right? The perceptual features override other information. They're over-relying on them. However, what is interesting is, and what makes the area of pretend play research very interesting is the fact that children actually engage in appearance reality in play. Long before they can pass appearance reality tasks, they actually attribute or assign pretend identities to objects, right? So they can, with no difficulty, imagine that an eraser is a telephone. But an eraser that looks like a telephone gives them difficulty. It is possible that in pretend task demands are reduced, uh, but um, it's also the case that child ass assigns the identity to the object in pretend. This is different than understanding two different representations based on how the reality is. But that's why many think that pretend play is a cognitive tool for children's symbolic understanding. I have three more slides on pretend play. I will talk about it more today. Um, and also, surprise, surprise, um, children actually engage in active deception before they're able to pass appearance reality tasks. So they may try to trick parents and friends before they are able to represent two things. Why is this important? Be in order to trick somebody, you need to represent how they're going to think about the world. So that's why it's very interesting. So before long, right now, I don't think Toprak is able to trick, but by two years of age, you're going to see first tricks. Uh, he's going to say, you know, um, I'm full to go watch television, for example. Uh, and so these, sometimes parents are very um, shaken when they see their little one has just told a lie. But lies are cognitive achievements. It is not easy to tell a lie. For example, 
with children with autism, when they start being able to deceive others, it is a developmental milestone. We celebrate it. Uh, of course, excessive lie telling isn't a good thing. But these early, very naive tricks signal to us that the children are progressing on the continuum, on the road to understanding other people's minds. Oh, that's also why, um, you know clowns scare little kids, right? Sometimes, you know, we, there's um, uh, some, pa some parents think that when they go to the circus, it is going to be fun and games, and the elephants are fun, and the tigers are fun, and the monkeys are fun. The clown comes up out, and your four-year-old starts crying. Now, the clown is a figure of appearance reality. It looks like something, but actually isn't that thing. And children find it difficult to reconcile that, and it can be scary, not for all children, but for a substantial amount. So do not, Santa Claus is the same thing. Uh, I've had many experiences at preschools where Santa Claus walked in in full costume and beard, and kids started crying. You, you'd think that you know, he's coming with presents, he's fat, he's cuddly, you know, it'd be fun. But also, I think that's why there's so many pictures, you know, in the States and other countries where they actually celebrate Christmas. They have Santa Claus at shopping malls. I don't know, I think we do it too now. Kent Park, I saw something of the sort, where there is somebody dressed in Santa Claus costume, and children are put on this pe person's lap, and they take a picture with Noel Baba. Do they do it here too? Yes. And then there are many pictures of young, like two, three-year-olds that are crying their hearts out, right? I mean, I, I have many of it on my Facebook uh, of friends. Why also is because the figure is a little scary. It is quite obvious that that is a you know, fake beard and like, you know, to think that there's another person underneath that appearance is a little bit scary. They still may be scared if it's they have like uh, uh, they experience a sort of stranger anxiety because usually those places are very crowded. It's not just like an old man sitting on an armchair. There are a lot of people. There's a lot of people in line. So I can't for sure tell you that they wouldn't be scared of other uh, features of the context. But I would think that it probably would be less of a problem. So far, we have talked about the limitations of pre-operational thought. What are some of the things that pre-operational children can do? They, as we said before, they have entered representational thought. Uh, they can use dual representation. They have language. And they can engage in pretend play. And why is pretend play interesting or important? Now, pretend play signals to us that the child can reason symbolically about objects, about actions, right? They, they can understand that if somebody goes like this, for example, although there is no food, no bowl, no spoon, that that person is pretending to eat. Somebody goes like, they understand that person is drinking, right? So in order for this to happen, uh, some theorists argue that the child needs to be able to represent in their mind a fantasy cup, fantasy tea, right? and me drinking it. And so this signals to us that the child has mental representation. More importantly, pretend play will become more and more elaborate, more and more complex. And as it does, it uses more and more symbolic thought. So, for example, it gradually becomes more detached from real life conditions. When babies pretend, when an 18-month-old pretends, they usually pretend with what they know. So they will, for example, pretend feeding, feeding, because that's something that happens all the time. They won't pretend uh, actions they've seen only a few times, right? Uh, or they won't pretend things that they haven't done themselves. Later, it is going to become less self-centered, meaning they're going to be able to pretend things that they have not done themselves, like pretend to drive a car, for example, that they've only seen others do. Much later, they may pretend to go to the moon. They may build a rocket. They may pretend 
to be an Indian in a tent. They may pretend that they are fighting from a castle. They may pretend they're a pirate without actually in real life having seen one, but having seen them on TV and whatnot. Of course, they get inspired by what's available around. They don't totally create un, you know, things that have no basis in reality. They're tied to reality in one way or another. But it's going to become less self-centered. They start by performing actions on themselves. They will then start performing actions on dolls and on other humans. So first they start feeding self, and then they will start feeding the teddy bear. Right? So remember Piaget, how he talked about uh, schemas that started with the self and then started including objects, right? So pretend play shows similar trajectories to his observations. There is a ton of literature, 70s, 80s, 90s, that actually looks at the progression of these. And it's very well documented. This there is no real big debate on. Later it is going to become sociodramatic, meaning what play starts out a little bit more uh, self-centered, and children's fir first playmates, especially in industrialized societies, are parents. Parents pretend with kids from very early ages, right? So first playmates are knowledgeable adults who keep guiding the play. Later, children around three and a half, four years of age, will start playing with friends. I mean, when I say three and a half, four, I mean effective playing. Two and a half year olds do play together, but they usually play side by side. They don't build play scenarios. Three and a half, three, three to four, they try, they try very hard to play. Very, very difficult. Uh, if you go into a preschool classroom, a three-year-old preschool classroom, you're going to hear a lot of arguments. You know, a lot of kids holding on to one end of the toy, saying it's mine, it's mine. Also, the concept of what's mine, what's not mine is developing. And it won't matter if there are ten of those toys in the classroom. Uh, and they may be, for very little periods of time, engaged in scripted routines together, but they don't have inventive, creative, sociodramatic play where there's give and take. That starts around four, four and a half years of age. So I think this is also something to keep in mind. Now, remember, uh, many parents are lured into play therapy, play, not therapy, play groups, right? There are a lot of play groups for parents. Baby play groups, toddler play groups, right? They advertise these things. And I sometimes wonder, what, is a, what does a first-time mother of an eight-month-old infant expect of a play date? <laughs> there is not much going to happen. Like, parents uh, sometimes expect that the kids will like, hug one another and like, you know, have some kind of proto-conversations. They may for like one or two seconds, but most of the time you're still going to be playing with your own kid. The, huh? Eight months, I said. A baby. I'm talking about baby groups, right? I have a friend who's, who now has taken, not now, for the past six months, with her 12-month-old uh, son, they're going to a music class on Sunday, somewhere around weekend. She says, but she makes a lot of fun of it, she says the mothers and fathers have a lot of fun and the babies are just sitting there. So like they do rhythm and stuff and like the parents are going this. And she said the other day after six months, they put the child back in the car, they're driving home and the child went <laughs> and they were like, yes. But the idea is, like, I mean, these are all helpful. I'm not saying don't take your kid to these activities, but what you expect out of them should be a little bit moderated. They are obviously going to have fun and they'll have the privilege of interacting with you in an interesting activity, right? But they won't start talking to their peers if they have three words, not yet. Yes? Start to share, informal knowledge. share what? No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say sharing starts in four and a half years of age. I said complex sociodramatic play where there is give and take, starts at four, four and a half years of age. 
So, okay, development of the play story uh, starts from very simple routines, what the child knows, and goes on to combinations of routines. So, for example, first Teddy goes to, Teddy takes a bath. Then Teddy takes a bath and goes to bed because that's what happens in the child's life. Then complex episode, Teddy wants a sandwich but cannot find it anywhere, Teddy is sad. So this is an achievement that comes later. A two-year-old who's pretending will not immediately come up with this. Of course. Again, a very good question. The question then becomes, and I think this is, this is what made you think of it, yeah. right? Um, so we said that children can't completely reason about other people's thoughts. We are going to see in um, emotion development, self-development, in theory of mind section, that that is actually true. But there are beginnings of thought. There are beginnings of, let me finish. There are beginnings of thought in the sense that children first understand intentions. They then understand, very quickly understand emotions. And when I say emotions, they start with basic emotions. So they're not going to understand, for example, being embarrassed, but they will understand being sad, being happy. At least the valence will be clear to them. They'll understand pos there are positive emotions, happy, and there's negative emotions. They may bundle. I'm going to have an emotions chapter where we talk about this. Uh, sadness, anger, and fear together at first. But in any case, they, they will start with intentions and they will be able to put emotions. By four years of age, children are able to attribute, for sure, simple emotions, intentions, very simple cognitions to inanimate objects like dolls and play. But it, uh, that also shows a whole lot of development and improvement. Starts with intentions, goes on to emotions, and the beginnings of cognition appear around four years of age. What is interesting, and Leila's question actually asks the heart of this, is children have so much difficulty when you give them these social problems and ask, what is this person thinking? What did this person think before? But they seem to have less trouble when they're engaged in play to reason about the mind. There is an industry of research that has investigated this. There are both those researchers and theories that argue that pretend play helps children think about others because it gives them a fun, stress-free context to experiment with thoughts, emotions of others. And there are others who say it is the other way around. Children first gain the ability and then they show it in pretend. I could teach a class about this. I'm already teaching a class about this. Uh, and so, but it's a very good question. It's a dilemma. Yes? OK, again, uh, it seems like uh, I'm a little bit lost in translation. I didn't say they start attributing emotions at four years of age. By four, they are able to, they start before. Now, um, they can attribute emotions to both uh, agents, inanimate and animate, um, by two and a half, three years of age. They become diversified, though. They're, like, so children can attribute a diverse array of emotions by four, right? And um, they can also, in addition, by four, four and a half, we start seeing the first signs of their attribution of cognition. What is this doll thinking? What does this doll believe? Right? So those don't come up before four years of age. And I also want to ask, can they start to give messages to their parents, like Teddy's sad and wants his sandwich, so I'm hungry, give me the sandwich? No. They're, they can't manipulate. I mean, those subtle cues aren't there. We're talking about kids who can't communicate openly with one another, right? We talked about egocentricism. We talked about how children aren't good communicators. They certainly will not consciously embed thoughts in their play and say, for example, we're not imagining Toprak at three years of age playing building a superhero and saying, Dad, look, I made a Batman, buy me one. 
That is not happening. They may unconsciously try to fulfill wishes. For example, a child who wants to hold his baby brother but isn't allowed because he's too young might play with a baby doll and pretend it's his brother for purposes of wish fulfillment without actually knowing they are doing that. Let's talk about it afterwards, okay? Because I will try to finish uh, the exam material, but please do come. So, okay, for object transformations as well, we see that they start using only realistic objects first, meaning if they're going to pretend to be on the phone, they need a plastic phone, okay? They won't be able to take a banana and start pretending. Uh, Two-year-olds can play with less realistic objects. Between two and three, they start uh, thinking about imaginary objects. Remember? No cup, but you're drinking from it? Yes. Please take in these ages. Piaget didn't like ages, so I don't like ages either. Not because Piaget didn't like them. There is a lot of individual variability. When I say an age, I mean the average child your neighbor's kid, your cousin's kid, your brother's kid might show different developmental profile. Uh, we don't even need to explain this. This is what happens on average. Obviously, a child, for example, who lives in an impoverished home with very few toys and with nobody to interact with will not show the, this progression. Like we, sh we should reason that way. All right. I already talked about this. So, I'll go through these two slides and then give a break, okay? Because I want to finish pretend play so that you can go enjoy your break. So, what are the benefits of make-believe play? <laughs> Believe me, there, we are still debating what, what, whether pretend play is useful and what are the benefits of it. Uh, but it seems like it helps language. It seems like it helps emotion integration, emotion regulation. It helps with attention, memory, and logical reasoning. It helps with imagination and creativity, or some of the um, arguments. There, are, um, there is research that shows both support for it and no support for these. But mostly, I can say that at least emotion regulation and language are two areas that have been linked more consistently with pretend play. Uh, and Piaget and play. Um, why? Well, Piaget's theory was one of the very first to actually look at children's play in cognitive development. Others had looked at play before. Freud did think about play, but it is not in the realm of cognitive development. Nobody was really systematically thinking about symbol representation, embedding of symbols, complex symbols. So at least um, he drew attention to play as a cognitive phenomenon, Show, talked about how it increases in cognitive complexity. He did pay less attention to the social aspect of pretend play. He was more interested, again, in knowledge ac acquisition and logical thinking. So he was looking at more of the symbolic aspects, and he didn't really uh, take into account that much children's social play, whether it be with parents, siblings, or with peers. But we will talk about Vygotsky, who will agree with Piaget, who will take his ideas, who will elaborate with his own input, and he will also add a very substantial social component to play. Okay? Now let's take a break for 10 minutes, and Ipek, and also you, 